In the newsletter, Johan sent us a brief overview of Leon's career, his current position and his academic background. Uh, from that, you should have gathered that he eats, sleeps and dreams internet connectivity every second of his working life. During a Zoom meeting to prepare for this presentation, Leon told us that he does have other interests as well. He is a keen mountain biker, albeit in Pretoria, and he also enjoys tennis. I'm looking forward to this presentation, and I'm sure that everyone else is also looking forward to this. Uh, thank you, Leon, and uh, over to you. Thank you, Derek, for the kind introduction. I hope you, everyone can hear me. Just first check. Yes, Leon, that sounds fine. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Right. So as Derek indicated, uh, you know, my career is rooted in telecommunications. Uh, I am a, an electronic engineer by trade. Uh, for a number of years, I, I, I taught telecommunications, information theory, encoding, and single processing, all these things related to telecommunications at, uh, at UP. Um, where after I headed up Motorola's training center that uh, effectively taught their clients throughout the Africa region how to build 2G and 3G networks at that stage. Um, then, then I entered the commercial, uh, the, the, the sales space in the commercial domain when I worked for Nokia Siemens for a while, specifically tending to the needs of uh, uh, Neotel and Broadband Infraco, some of these big telecommunications providers in South Africa. Thereafter, I joined the CSIR, initially, uh, you know, getting back to my roots in the research and specifically signal processing. Um, but, but later again, finding my, my, my way back to telecommunications when in 2013, uh, I took on the role as director for the South African National Research Network, or SANREN. So SANREN is, and, and I'll, I'll discuss SANREN towards the end of my presentation, give you guys a little bit of an overview of what it is and what we do. But effectively, it is a, a team within the CSR tasked with the responsibility of building a broadband network for all higher education and science institutions in the country. So all 26 uh, public sector universities, some of the private ones as well, and, and then all the science councils, the big science experiments and so on, get their internet connectivity from us. So I'll, I'll tell you guys a little bit, bit about our network um, and, and these networks in general, you know, national research and education networks, because it's not, not a, a field that a lot of people uh, are, are, are aware of, even though, you know, national research and education networks are really where the internet started. Right. But the, the, the bulk of my presentation will be focused more towards the commercial telecommunications environment and specifically things that could potentially impact you guys as individual users. All right, so um, let me get going. So my first slide is a slide that I borrowed from my broadband. It's, it's somewhat dated, but it, I still find it fairly appealing. Um, and I'm going to just for the moment zoom in a little bit because it's, uh, it's not the most easy slide to read because of the size of the fonts. Um, but this is an overview of, of some of the main things that happen in the telecommunication space in South Africa um, since the 1800s, right? And uh, um, you know, South Africa, interestingly enough, has been at the forefront of implementing telecommunication systems. Um, so so it, it's, a, it's, it's a very nice overview that sort of gives you an idea of what happened in the various kinds of mediums over the, the various years. So from a radio perspective, uh, you know, in South Africa, we had radio communications and specifically radio broadcasts and te te telegraphy systems um, all the way back to the 1880s. Um, copper wire started even before that. Um, and then copper wire for internet, intercontinental telecommunications, so undersea cables and so forth, we already had in the 1950s. Um, if we start looking at more recent technologies that we have now, we can see that fiber optics started really getting uh, getting going in South Africa in the 1980s, and it is pretty much now the standard um, technology on which we base the bulk of our our network infrastructure in the country. Um, as I'll as I'll present a little bit later on, copper is sort of reaching the the, the end of its life. Um, and then obviously, um, as things progressed, the, the wireless communication systems the, the entered the, the, the South African space as well. And, and we now have, you will see it here at the top on that presentation, apologies, let me just go back a little bit. You'll see that uh, we, we introduced uh, second generation mobile uh, uh, voice communications already in the 1990s. I believe it was about 1992. Um, and, and we're sort of gearing up now in, in 2020 to start implementing uh, 5G at scale. There's already some 5G rollouts in the country now. 
Um, but handsets are something that's that's only really entering the market now. So, so for 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 South Africa in the in the mobile space, we sort of skipped over over uh, the 1G stage in, in the, the evolution of mobile communications. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit of, about, about what exactly 1G was. Um, effectively, it was uh, old analog systems. Right. And then, then uh, you know, uh, also covered in this, uh, this overview is, is, you know, technology such as satellite communications, which has been with us for a long, long time. You know, uh, some of you might have visited Hartbeer's Hook, where we have a, a massive satellite receiver station. Um, and, uh, and and this technology, um, even though it's 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 fairly old, has evolved significantly as well from the the more classic geospatial kind of arrangements, whereby satellites stay fixed in orbit over specific locations on the planet, and and those those kinds of arrangements are used typically for the DSTVs and 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 backbone connectivity for telecommunications, all the way through to the more exciting new things that's coming, you know, the, the SpaceX's and Amazon's and, and OneWeb's that are, are punting this idea that uh, satellite connectivity might be the silver bullet to ensure everyone gets high amounts of connectivity at low, low cost. So uh, again, later on in the presentation, I'll delve a little bit into, um, into satellite comms and what's been happening in that space and what can we, we expect. Um, also covered in this uh, slide is, is, you know, some, some, some history of, of uh, um, things like, for example, the use of personal communication, uh, per personal, personal computers in South Africa, and specifically the implementation of land, land networks, local area uh, networks, such as Wi-Fi and so forth. Um, given the time constraints we have, I'm not gonna delve too much deeper into this slide. So, uh, so if any of you have any questions around the history and what happened when in South Africa, by all means, um, if you if you can't find it out of this uh, this specific slide, by all means, uh, uh, contact me directly, and I'll, I'll see if I can get you the the appropriate dates for what you're looking for. With that, I'd like to to move on to uh, to a quick discussion on telecommunications standards. In the telecommunications world, um, we we live, eat, and breathe standards, right? And this sort of emanates out of, of blunders in the earlier stages of, of uh, computer networks. You know, in the 70s, we had, uh, you know, organizations such as IBM, uh, the D Digital Equipment Corporation, DEC, and so forth, building, um, um, you know, bespoke network infrastructure specifically for, at that stage, you know, the, the, the microcomputer uh, uh, um technologies that were being implemented at research organizations and, and universities and so forth. The, the dilemma that they found is, is that if you, if you let's say, for example, built a, a deck based uh, um, network for your microcomputer arrangement at your university or a Xerox, Xerox was popular as well, you were sort of stuck with that technology, right? You, you could only use their end devices, um, their, their network equipment and so forth. You, you couldn't inter, interface different vendors equipment with one another. So uh, it, it, it meant that um, the, 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 the cost for telecommunications at that stage is very expensive. Digital communications or, or you know, um, networking communications were very expensive. Um, so there was a drive to try and standardize uh, the, the, um, the evolution of our telecommunication systems, both wireless and, 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 and wired, um, in an effort to try and ensure that more players could enter the, the market to produce solutions at lower cost. So the slide that I have up now, and I'm hoping you guys, hoping you guys can all see this, sort of lists some of the, the main players in the, in the standard space. And there's actually hundreds and hundreds of these organizations, but the big ones, um, uh, which you might've heard of before, are the, the, the ANSI's, the IEEE, um, the Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers. And you'll find as we go through my slides is that a lot of the standards of the technologies we're using now are actually ratified and produced by the IEEE. Then there's also organizations such as the International Telecommunications Union that plays a very important role in the standardization of mobile communications. Um, the International Standards Organization itself plays a big role. Um, and then we have uh, organizations such as the engineering, uh, um, the Internet Engineering Task Force and Society that, that is geared towards building internet technologies on top of telecommunications. Um, right, so as I, as, I, as I mentioned, this is just a very brief summary of the various organizations that play an important role in, in standardization. 
let me move on to the next slide. So, so while while standards uh, definitely assist yep, us in ensuring uh, uh, apologies. I can just interrupt quickly. I'm still seeing the original PDF that you shared with us. Oh goodness! Um, if that is the case, I'm quickly going to just jump to good old presentations. Okay, so I see you on the telecommunication standards now. Okay, let me just quickly. I'm I'm hoping. You guys can see the screen now. Uh, this this is the slide on network standards organizations that, that I'm hoping you can see at the moment. Yes. Uh, I've, I've now moved on to a slide that talks about uh, the the open systems interconnect seven layer model. Is this uh, is this visible to you guys at the moment, Derek? Yes, it is. OSI yeah. uh, like seven layer model created in 1984. Yes, okay. exactly. Right. So so. Um, in the effort to create these various standards, um, the 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 uh, the ISO, the International Organization for Standardization, they they discovered that um, you know even going the standards route will still result in, a, in an extremely complex environment. Um, if if uh, you know if, if, you, if you simply look at where telecommunication standards are now, there are literally thousands and thousands of standards. So in, in, the, in the early 80s, they, they uh, spent some time to try and propose a framework to create some sense in the madness. Um, and they came up with a, a, a seven layered framework called the Open Systems Interconnection Model or the OSI seven layer model. And this is what is presented on this slide on the left hand side. And, and the goal of this framework was that any standard that's produced can either address one or multiples of the layers in this framework. But the idea is, is that if you're talking telecommunications, everything can be explained based on seven specific layers. Right now, I'm not going to spend too much time explaining how the model works. I'll very briefly run through it. So at the lowest level, at the, at the layer one level, if you look towards the bottom, you, you'll see that there is a layer called the physical layer. So this has to do with the medium on which we communicate. You know whether this is radio waves, whether it is fiber optic cable, whether it is uh, you know whether it is smoke for smoke signals. Now, right, so that's our physical medium. On top of that, you have a layer called the data link layer. So the data link layer has to do with communications on a hop by hop basis. So if you look at how we communicate in networks, um, obviously you and and the end receiver on the other side want to talk to one another, but the way that you get there is typically uh, um, uh, involves your, uh, your message transversing a number of hops or a number of links. And, and a nice analogy here would be, for example, the postal system, right? So you want to send a letter to a friend of yours. So you drop this off at, at your local post office and it then is transported through a series of, distrib uh, you know, a series of, 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 uh, of routes to distribution centers. And it eventually reaches your friend after having gone through these various hops. So in telecommunications, we call those hops effectively data links, right? So the second layer has to do with managing how we put data on these, these individual hops. And, and you'll see some of the important standards that you guys use on a day-to-day -day basis actually fitting in nicely there. For example, um, Wi-Fi fits into, into both the data link and physical layer, um, as does Bluetooth, Ethernet, um, uh, you know, those kinds of standards all fit into layer one and two. They span those two domains. One level up has to do with the end-to-end -end communication, right? So this is now, if we again use the analogy of you speaking with your friend, it has to do with how you connect all the way from, from, from where you sit to where your friend sits, right? And it has to do with addressing, end-to-end -end addressing. And we've all heard of IP addresses, right? We use IP addresses on a daily basis. So this fits into layer three. And um, there's a variety of other things that also fit into layer three, for example, um, for us as network engineers, what's important there is, is that we need to route messages from, from source to destination in the most efficient way. So a lot of these routing protocols and standards that define how we get the message from your IP address to your friend's IP address is defined at layer three. The transport layer has to do with controlling the flow of information end to end. You know, it's similar to, to, to layer two, but, but it has the goal of doing that at an end to end basis. So for example, um, if, if you send a, uh, an email to a friend of yours and it doesn't uh, arrive intact on the other side, there are protocols that will effectively request that parts of the missing message get retransmitted. 
Um, so, so some of you might know protocols such as TCP, Transmission Control Protocol, that resides within the transport layer. If we move up one more layer, we now get to, to a layer called session, right? Now session has to do with starting up a communication and stopping a communication. So setting up sessions and stopping sessions are controlled at this level. It also embeds things like security, you know, end-to-end -end security encryption and so forth. Layer six has to do with presentation, right? So this has to do with effectively sticking the, the message you wanna send into the right format, which in, in our current world that we live in now isn't it, it's it's it gets stuck into bits and bytes and ones and zeros right but things are evolving you know a, a few decades from now we might find that communications have evolved to span also quantum communication where we will no longer use ones and zeros to transmit information but we'll use quantum entangled bits um, and i have a little bit of that later on as well because this is something new that's coming so, and then at the, the, the highest level is really what do you want to accomplish with this communication? Is it an email that you're sending? Is it a web page that you're browsing? Is it a voice conference session? Um, so that is the application layer. So this is how the OSI seven layer model looks. And effectively any telecommunication system can be broken up into these seven layers. And any standard that's being developed or currently exists spans either one or more of these layers. On the right hand side, just quickly to show you guys typically what happens on a network, if you think of the network in the seven layer model approach, you will start a sender with some data that you want to send, maybe an email. So your application would be your email application. The email application would package that in the right ones and zeros using things like ASCII and all kinds of standards. And it'll, it'll package it into, into the email message you want to send. That'll then go down to the session layer, which has to do with setting up a, 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 a mail delivery session. So the, the, the mail service will be informed that you want to send a message, you know, uh, the send mail server and so forth. That then goes down to transport. So transport typically we use for most of our internet communications these days, we use TCP, Transmission Control Protocol, or UDP. Um, uh, um, and UDP is sort of a, a, a size down flavor of TCP where you don't do fixes if things get lost. Then it goes to the network layer. So it gets tagged with end-to-end -end IP addresses, your address, your friend's address, and it now runs across this network and it gets routed through all kinds of routers and switches. At a data link level, how data gets stuck onto the physical medium is structured in a way that's defined by whatever data link technology you're using and this might be wi-fi it might be you know ethernet over fiber um, um, so there's a variety of technologies there it might be 5g and so forth and then your physical layer obviously is, is the the medium that it travels across you know it might be air it might be fiber um, and, and uh, you know it might be water you know there's there's a variety of different technologies one of the interesting new technologies that i'll talk about a little bit later on is something called li-fi where light is used as a as visible light is used as a transmission medium. Right, so let me move on to the next slide. Derek, just to check, you guys can see this slide, hopefully in its entirety. Optic communications. That's the one, right. So on optic communications, which is pretty much now where the world is, is at, right? This is, the, this is the basis on which the bulk of our internet infrastructure is built, right? Especially if you look at the portions that that constitute what we call the backbone. So the backbones are, are, are the big pipes that interconnect cities and, and countries and so forth. And the, the undersea cables or the submarine cables that interconnect continents, as well as metro networks. You know, if you look at a city, there's a fair amount of fiber infrastructure inside a city that is required to get to, for example, your house or your office or so forth. When we get to, to end user uh, uh, links, you know, for example, you connecting to the internet, then, then wireless plays a fairly important role, as you all know, with Wi-Fi and 2G, 3G, 4G, and so on. But in the bulk of the rest of the network, fiber is really where things are at, right? Now, there's two ways in which we can do optic communications with fiber being pretty much the standard. There is a second way in which you can do optical communications, and that is actually to throw out the fiber optics completely and use direct laser to transceiver communications through the air, right? And that's where the name comes from, free space optics. Now, this is a very interesting way of communicating. It's not standardized, which is great. Unfortunately, it's limited to fairly uh, short distances. You know, we're talking about three kilometers at low speeds, you know, one gigabits per second. 
but it is still important for, for example, connecting, let's say you've got a campus full of buildings and you want to interconnect buildings, or you've got a CCTV security camera system in your estate that you want to interconnect. Um, uh, so free space optics plays an important role there. But I'd like to focus on fiber-based comps, right? So the, the idea of fiber communications, um, you know, optical communications over fiber is, is built around this, this good old physics concept of total internal reflection that occurs between two distinct optical media when your angle is great enough. I don't know if you guys remember this from school days, but effectively you bounce the light down a optically less dense medium that's surrounded by an optically more dense medium if you look at a fiber. So, so fiber is used, as I, I mentioned, by and large for the bulk of our networks, right? Submarine links, backbone links, metro links, and then also for a large portion of our, our well, obviously for our fiber to the, what we call the FTTX domain, right? And this is the fiber to the home and fiber to the business domain, right? We effectively have two types of fiber optic cabling, right? The, the, uh, the, we have something called single mode fibers and we have multi-mode fibers. Single mode fibers are only really designed and built and manufactured to carry one wavelength, one color of light. And it's specifically designed for a specific color. Whereas multi-mode allows you to carry multiple wavelengths of light, right? So, so multi-mode is really where we are going in terms of capacity, getting more people onto the same fiber, but it comes with all kinds of dilemmas, right? Multi-mode fibers, uh, you can't have as long distances using multi-mode as you can with, with single mode. The losses that you experience in multi-mode is more than on single mode. So single mode still has an important role to play, especially if you're talking long, long distance communications. So if we look at fiber optic cabling standards, they're usually standardized and, and specified according to a variety of characteristics, you know, from diameters and, and you know, how they're sheathed and so forth. But the primary thing that they're, they're, they're standardized based on is the, the actual wavelength of the light, the color of the light that's being transmitted or can be transmitted down a fiber. For example, fiber that it, we use fairly frequently, a single mode fiber, um, which is standardized by the ITUT as the G652 fiber carries specifically about 1,300 nanometers wavelength of light, a specific color, right? If we get back to the, the concept of multi-mode where we can carry multiple peoples or multiple streams of information on a single, single fiber optic cable, that is really where a technology called dense wave division multiplexing enters uh, the interest, the domain, right? And this is for us as telecommunications engineers and, and, and the builders of big broadband networks, the core of what we do on fiber networks. We effectively use technology that allow us to stick many, many, many uh, ones and zeros on a single, uh, on, 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 on single colors of light. And, and then we, we multiplex multiple colors of light onto single fiber pairs which effectively allows us to get to insane kinds of bandwidth. So you'll see it, my last bullet talks a little bit about the kind of capacities that we can actually get through on fiber optic at the moment. So on a single wavelength, uh, we can now get up to as high as 400 gigabits per second in, in the field, while in the labs that are already at a terabit per second. So uh, a, a terabit is a, a thousand thousand megabits per second, right? Just to give you guys an idea of how big that is. Um, obviously, this, this, you know, the, the, the DWDM and so forth all has to do with the physical layer, right? So layer one, we still need to stick the data on top of the colors of light in a specific way. And there's different ways to do this, depending on what part of the networks you're looking at. For example, with, with um, our big BATCO networks and the networks in the cities um, that, that create sort of the, 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 the backbone infrastructure onto which everything else connects, there we typically use a protocol called carrier ethernet. While if we look at what happens at, at your home, your, your, your fiber connection that comes into your house, that typically uses a, a, um, a physical layer technology called PON, Passive Optical Networking, and it runs on top of that at layer two and up something called point-to-point -point protocol over ethernet or PPOE. So, so, so um, the, the, the difference here has to do with cost. Cost is a big driver. Obviously, we'd like to deliver everyone the carrier grade kind of, of connectivity that ethernet provides, but it's expensive. It needs power. It needs space. The devices are big. You know, for example, your 
little device that you maybe have from Afrios or Vox or what have you that connects to your fiber link at home is, you know, it's not, not much bigger than the palm of your hand. While if you look at an Ethernet switch, you will be talking something that's typically uh, uh, the size of multiple pizza boxes. So, um, so size is an issue as well. Right. Um, at this stage, Derek, I wonder if I can quickly allow people to maybe ask a question or two. I, I know it gets a bit much to remember all the questions towards the end of the presentation. So maybe I should open the floor just for a question or two. Right, we can do that. Any questions? Maybe one from my side just to start. I noticed yeah. on your opening slide there that the jump from 2G to 3G to 4G and now lately 5G yeah. seems to yeah. step up roughly about every 10 years. Is that planned or coincidental? Um, <laughs> look, uh, uh, um, uh, in, in the older days when, when, uh, when 2G, 3G and 4G was being developed, I think um, it, it, was, it was largely driven, the, the, the speed of, of, of going from one generation to another was largely driven by the availability of new technology becoming, uh, becoming available for, for them to include into standards. Um, what is happening at the moment, I think, is largely driven by market forces, right? It has to do with, you know, getting to, to address the, the growing bandwidth demands of, 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 of end users, but also selling them, you know, the latest gadget, you know, because if you really go and delve into the detail of 4G and 5G, these things use as underlying technologies, you know, the, at the physical layer and, and, and data link layer and so forth, they use things that's fairly similar, right? So it's, it's all about sales as well. So um, I think a, a rhythm evolved due to the progression of technology itself. And now, you know, due to market forces, they're sort of trying to stick to that rhythm. Um, that, but that's just my theory. Good. And then Anne wants to know if 400 gigs is available, why are we getting streaming problems in our homes? So remember, um, so, so 400 gig is, is the kind of capacity that you're talking about when we're talking about backbone links. So the fiber that, let's say, fiber links from Telcom and, and, and Neotel, um, you know, Fiberco, Seacom, all of these guys that, that provide big backbone links to interconnect cities. Um, uh, they can carry that kind of capacity on a wavelength. And we typically have, actually have you know, up to 96 channels or 96 wavelengths on a fiber. So you actually have 400 gig times 96. Right? That's where we can get. Um, in South Africa, we're not quite at 400 gig yet. We have a number of networks that's, that's currently running at 100 gig per wavelength, including our network, Sandrin, now runs at 100 gig per wavelength. But we're only occupying, you know, uh, uh, you know less than 10 wavelengths out of the 96 that we can actually stick onto a fiber at this stage. Now, remember that you have literally millions of users that are generating their own data streams. These things get aggregated through cellular base stations, through your know, PON access points and so forth. And, and it gets aggregated and multiplexed eventually onto a, you know, single or, or, or you know, a low number of fiber, fiber pairs that interconnects the cities. So, so the, 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 these big pipes have to have that kind of capacity because it's literally carrying in parallel thousands, even millions of users' traffic. That being said, when, when we talk a little bit about research and education networks, in our case, we connect um, you know, end users uh, in the form of universities and big science experiments. You guys probably have heard of the Square Kilometer Array. That's one of our big, big uh, um, end beneficiaries that's connected onto our network. These guys have very specific requirements. Just to give you guys an idea, the Square Kilometer Array will require uh, you know, network connectivity from Carnarvon down to Cape Town that'll that, that'll most probably hit close to 20 terabits per second, right? And that's one single user. So, um, so they have a completely different use case. So, but, but yes, um, a, a little bit later on, I'll talk a little bit about pricing and, and, and comparing South Africa's connectivity pricing to other countries. And you will note that many countries are already offering their end users, you know, a gigabit and, and higher connections to your house. And it's a rotten shame we're not there. But 400 gig, that's still a, that's still a while off um, at this stage. I hope that answers the question. Good. And then just one quick other question. Um, when we look at television, the image we see is actually a blend of a few primary colors. Why do these colors not mix down a dense wave division multiplex and fiber? 
So, so the, the, the colors that's used, the RGB kind of scheme that's used for, for, um, for television is, is, is visible light, right? What we're, what we're talking about is, is, is uh, higher up in the radio spectrum that's not, not necessarily visible. You know, we start getting to infrared, it becomes, uh, you know, red and infrared becomes visible, but it's largely not visible to the human eye. Um, the, 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 the concept of dense wave division multiplexing is, is that you can actually, when you look at different colors, you can choose frequencies or wavelengths for colors in a way that they interfere less with one another when they're put onto the same medium. Right? And this has to do with, uh, you know, in, in the signal processing domain, uh, a concept called orthogonality. Right, and Fourier transforms and those kinds of things. So the, 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 the kind of colors and the wavelengths that we choose to transmit telecommunication signals on are chosen very specific at very specific frequencies. And we also control their phases very specifically. So it's a bit more complex than television, right? Television is fairly easy. Your, your eye takes the, 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 the three colors and it combines it fairly rudimentary. You know, what we're doing at, on a DWDM system is to, to, to really uh, um, uh, go and do a very detailed analysis of the incoming light. And we extract a single wavelength with high, high precision, much more than what your eye can do. Um, again, I'm not quite sure that answers the question, but, but yes, the, the, the concept of having multiple colors, it's, it's used on your television as well. Your, your eye is just not as good as a receiver, as a DWDM receiver. Great, thanks, Leon. I think we can continue with the presentation then. Great. So, so what I wanted to quickly just touch on is also is copper, right? Because copper was part of our lives for many, many years. It's, you know, if you look at, at that, uh, that timeline, it actually was part of our, our telecommunications history for, for, for a good century, right? Um, and, and just to touch on where things are going now. Um, so so um, if, you, if you look at communications over copper, there's, there's sort of three main areas where copper communications plays a role, right? There's the, 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 the infrastructure or technologies called copper local loop, wide area networking technologies. And this is typically what Telcom had in place for many, many years in South Africa, right? And they had a monopoly on that. And, and they also did not want to share that infrastructure with other, other telcos, which actually in South Africa expedited our move to fiber to the home and fiber to the business because the likes of liquid telecoms and, and Neotel and so on could simply, they could simply not use the, 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 the copper that uh, um, telcom had in the ground. That being said, the, the, the kind of protocols and, and standards that we, that we use on top of, of this infrastructure, again, now the copper is now layer one, but on top of that, we need data link layer technology, network layer, transport layer, and so forth. So the technology that has been evolved to, to use copper infrastructure for internet connectivity is something called digi digital subscriber line, or DSL. And many of you guys might have had in the past an ADSL link, right? And it, it effectively, um, it was a modem technology that was capable of sensing the, the available spectrum on a, a copper line um, and, and then filling it up with bits until it's, it's full, right? So it's a, it's a nice little example of something called a, a cognitive radio or a smart radio, right? So, um, and it was a fantastic technology, but it was a stopgap, right? It was never intended to be the be all and end all. It was there to milk the infrastructure that was already in place. And many of you guys might have seen this, is that, uh, um, you know, uh, most networks across the globe now, maybe not in, you know, less advantaged areas such as Africa and, and, and you know, Eastern Asia and, and maybe parts of, you know, South America, um, we see large efforts to rip out the old uh, uh, local loop infrastructure and replace it by fiber. And, and some of you might have experienced this, you know, in the form of, of you being uh, forced to migrate your telecom phone onto either a 3G phone or some VoIP phone that sits on a fiber connection, right? And this, you know, uh, uh, is also reflected in the fact that if you go and look at the standardization for DSL, it's sort of stopped, right? It's this, this, the standard for this now end. There's a fair amount of effort in trying to, to, to migrate some of the DSL technologies onto fiber, but, you know, how sensible that is in the, in the advent of things like, you know, Ethernet and, and PON, I don't know. So and nonetheless, you know, RIP ADSL, right? Things have sort of come to an end. If you look towards Europe and the US and so forth, though, there's, there's, there's a fair amount of infrastructure that's put in place, copper infrastructure put in place, specifically to carry 
cable television. And that infrastructure will remain in place for the foreseeable future. And that is still running uh, uh, internet services at this stage. So there is there's still a fair amount of, of, of internet traffic traveling over those kinds of media as, as backbone and metro solutions. And then the part of corporate communications that we all still do use, and that is your, your, your land cabling in your, in your office or at your home and so forth, right? Um, and it's still evolving, right? We, we now have the latest standards for cabling uh, called a CAT7 Ethernet cable, which is capable of carrying 10 gigabits per second capacity, which is amazing, right? Um, and, and this is going to continue for the foreseeable future, right? So let me move on to mobile communication. So mobile communications, as, as you guys know, there's, there's, uh, there's been these various generations of, of mobile communications, right? So it, it evolved from, from the first initial systems that were completely analog, right? And there were actually three of those. This slide that I've got, got up here is a little bit UK focused, but there were actually three of these systems. There, there was TAX, the Total Access Communication System, then there was AMPS, the American mobile uh, phone system, and there was the Nordic mobile telephony system, right? And these things were analog systems, right? Voice were not digitized into ones and zeros. They were transmitted as per, you know, the same kind of ways in which two-way radio works. With 2G, um, which entered sort of the space of, of you, know, uh, you know, started entering the space around early 1990s, we started seeing the first 2G systems with those systems being things like GSM in the US, there was also something called IS-95. Um, these systems were, were digital systems, right? But they were largely geared for, for voice, right? So they were built to digitize voice and transmit these, uh, these, vo these digitized voice signals using cellular technology, right? Now, the concept of cellular simply has to do with the fact that you create coverage by creating a multitude of, of base transceiver and this, uh, transceiver stations, right? So cell sites, um, right? So 2G itself also went through some evolution through its existence, right? At some stage, we started getting something called GPRS, which still used the same kind of technology on the physical air, on the air interface, but it now had the ability to also package into it very rudimentary internet connectivity and internet traffic. It also went through a bit of an upgrade on the air interface side, on the physical layer, right? So the, the kind of radios that they used in, in GSM phones and, and edge pho or GPRS phones eventually evolved to more sophisticated radios that could do better with the radio spectrum that was available. So those of you that do know about modulation schemes, this started using more complex modulation schemes than just simple Gaussian minimum shift keying. And, and that technology was called edge. Right, so Edge was pretty much, you know, GSM and GPRS on steroids, but all still under the banner of 2G, right? Then 3G entered the, 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 this, the, the world, right, around the early 2000s. Um, again, there were, there were sort of two main drives there. There was a US drive and there was a European drive. And, and this led to somewhat different standards evolving initially, but eventually, um, things got ratified into a single standard. So in the US, they used a technology called co-division multiple access in order to, to put multiple people onto the same, same media. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go into the detail in that, but it's a, it's, it's a very interesting technology called, uh, that, that it uses called spread spectrum. Um, while the European guys prefer to, to go a bit of a different route where they, they stuck users into different frequencies, very similar to what was used for both the 1G and 2G systems. Um, and, and, and they did that in, in all kinds of new, new ways and new flavors, um, you know, the latest being something called uh, uh, orthogonal frequency division multiple access or OFDM. Um, but eventually things sort of settled on OFDM and the OFDM kind of way of doing the physical layer for cellular technology also became the standard for a lot of other things. For example, Wi-Fi now uses that same radio standard as does Bluetooth and so forth. Um, so, so, um, so, so initially when 3G came out, we just knew it as 3G, right? In, in the US, they used to call it WCDMA, right? Then a little bit later on, as, as, as things evolved, um, uh, more improvements happened in terms of how data was stuck into the physical interfaces, how it was compressed, encoded, uh, you know, made a bit more sturdy to survive the, the radio channel. And that led us to, to sort of the, the, the evolution of 3G that is referred to as high, high speed packet access. 
And initially we in South Africa only had one version of this. I think we had high, high speed downlink packet access, HSDPA. Um, so you could receive internet traffic on, on the standard, but you couldn't transmit up, but that's fine because internet traffic is asymmetric. You largely receive and you send small requests, but it evolved, right? Um, now the marketing guys, they, they, they hyped things up a little bit. At some stage, they started calling HSPA, you know, 3.75G and so forth. But per the standards, there is nothing like 3.753. It's all 3G, right? Then 4G entered, uh, the, 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 was the next to enter the, the, uh, the, uh, this, the, the mobile telecommunications space. And, and with 4G, a lot of the focus was shifted from, from, from the air interface. You know, the, the prior, prior standards, 1G, 2G, 3G, a lot of it was focused on making the radio side of it better. You know, the, the way in which we stick the ones and zeros into the radio channels. With 4G, the focus was more towards how the network is constructed and how it's managed, how calls are routed. So it had to do with the, the back end side of the networks, you know, in, in internet protocol technology, IP technology and so forth became the standard way of transporting data in the backbone of your mobile network. And maybe I should have mentioned this up front is, is that the part that we experience as users on mobile networks, the, 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 the air side of it is a very small part of the mobile networks. The bulk of the infrastructure and mobile networks and where all the time and effort and money is being spent is not just building the base stations, but connecting the base stations to, to uh, um, you know, to, to all of the big switching centers that decide where calls go, that manage calls during their duration and so forth. And with 4G, a, a lot of that evolved there. And 5G, in my view, also is focused on an evolution in that space. It again has improvements on the air interface. It occupies new spectrum in terms of available radio spectrum. But a big portion of its, its um, advance is actually in the core network side to make sure that at the back end, you can carry a lot more traffic. Right, so I have a bit of a slide here that tries to sort of unpack some of the basic differences between the various generations. Um, and it's by no means you know, uh, 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 exhaustive, but it does give you a good idea of the big, big differences, right? So you can see from 1G, which was pure analog voice, to 2G, where we started getting voice and data services, 2.5 and 2.7G, 2.5, sort of the marketing lingo for, for GPRS, 2.75 was the lingo for, for Edge. You can see now they evolved the data side, they had better radio services and so forth. Then 3G entered our, our space and where we had uh, more advanced ways in which we multiplex data onto our radio interfaces. And what is maybe most important is to sort of note the, the various speed changes. You know, we went from a, a very low 14.4 kilobits per second, even lower than 2G. And you might ask, why is this the case? Well, that had to do with the fact that uh, in 2G and GSM, they actually implemented some, some fancy um, a voice codecs, you know, voice compression technology, which was not available in 1G. Um, in 2G, uh, all the way up to 2.75G, you know, we, we got as high as 171 kilobits per second. And that is if you were the only guy on the network standing right next to the base station. With 3G, things, things got a bit more interesting, right? So, so we at least got to, th to three megabits per second. And, and we still have 3G in our networks now. I don't know if you guys see this frequently, especially if you're traveling in, in sort of remote places, but your, your phone still drops to 3G and even some, sometimes to 2G. Um, you might ask, why are these old technologies still in place? And it has to do a lot with the fact that these older technologies has immense reach. You know, the cell sizes for those things are, are massive, while the newer technologies are really concentrated kind of technologies. You have smaller cells. So if you're driving along a national road, um, you know, to populate a national road with 5G, for example, I don't think that's going to happen in the near future. We'll have we'll have HSDPA and HSUPA coverage on our national roads for a long time to come because it's affordable and it has it has significant reach. These smaller shells for 5G and 4G, they're expensive, right? We're not going to see many of them along a national road, for example. But things evolve, right? Um, the, the, the telco environment likes or telecommunications uh, uh, um, uh, uh, community likes to talk about uh, islands of coverage where you have the big islands being the 2G technologies all the way down to the small islands of coverage being 5G and 4G. 
All right. So, so things really got interesting and got useful for us uh, in terms of internet connectivity around 3.5G. And remember, 3.5G's real uh, terminology was actually HSPA, like high speed packet access. And this is where we started seeing speeds of three megabits up to 14.4. And, and many of us still use this as, as a connectivity means that, uh, you know, today. With 4G, we started seeing proper broadband connectivity, right? So with, with, uh, with 4G and, 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 and 4G uses, as I, as I mentioned, uh, um, a, a radio technology called uh, um, uh, OFDMA, and it, it, um, it evolved into something called long-term evolution, LTE. Um, we, we, were, we were able to now get our speeds up to, to typically to 200 megabits per second, even higher. Now you might say, well, I'm not, I'm not seeing 100 megabits per second on my, my cell phone. Well, there's a number of reasons for that. One is, is that there's obviously a lot of people on the network that's contesting for bandwidth, right? So, uh, you know, um, contention means that we need to share what's available. Secondly, is this, um, many a times you are moving around. When you move around, your, your, your user device and the network spends a fair amount of the bandwidth actually just managing movement, right? So handing over from one cell to another. Um, and, and together with that movement, obviously, you also experience more degradation of your, your transmission. So you need, to, you need to pad the data up with more, um, um, you know, more redundancy, parity checks and those kinds of things to ensure that you can fix errors in the data. And then lastly is, is that, you know, the, the kind of devices that can carry this kind of capacity, um, they're expensive. You know, to put them into a cell phone will make your already expensive 20K cell phone probably two or three times that expensive. So, so um, even though the standard defines this, we don't typically experience this as end users. Now we move to 5G, um, as, as I mentioned, this, this is a further evolution of, of, of the radio interface, but largely an, a, an evolution of what happens at the back end. You know, the, 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 the broadband technologies used in the, in the, the back end networking, um, which, is, which is all fiber based, right? But here we're talking about you know, speeds as high as one to 10 gigabits per second. Again, that would be if you're stationary, only guy on the network and so forth. What I foresee we'll typically experience as end users would be, would be in the region of 100 to maybe 100 to maybe 500 megabits per second uh, speeds that you'll see when you, um, when you use a 5G phone. Right. Um, lastly, this slide is just sort of to, to um, to show you guys the, the, the wide variety of, of standards that's used um, and, and terminology that's used in defining a, a radio access network for 4G and 5G. And it, I'm not going to go into it at all, but just to show you guys this, these things are immensely, immensely complex, right? They are extremely complex. What is interesting though is by, by evolving the back end networking from, from what we had with 1G and 2G and even 3G, which were really uh, you know, uh, bespoke technologies developed for those mobile networks. You know, for example, the interconnections between base stations for 2G used a standard that only worked for 2G, right? It was very specific, right? The, the technology that was developed for 2G and similarly for 3G. With 4G and 5G, the move to make everything, you know, IP, TCP, IP based over fiber networks to some extent actually simplified things. So you can now put on one single box that can either be a base station or it can be a router or it can be a switch and it can do many different functions and it talks one single language with the rest of the network. It doesn't have all of these unique and intricate interfaces that we had with the older standards. Right, again, I think, uh, Derek, maybe I should pause here for some questions because I'm, I'm, I'm guessing this is where a lot of people will, will have questions. Yes, Leon, we do have some questions. Um, there's a question here from Anne. Why are there objections to 5G in some quarters? And then maybe just from my side, what is the link between 5G and the COVID pandemic? So, okay. So, um, so on the first question, you know, <laughs> it's the, the, uh, the tinfoil hat community that believes that 5G is going to give you all kinds of illnesses, right? Including COVID. Um, I, I, I really don't know where this is coming from. Obviously, there are, there are health issues with any wireless technology that needs to be considered. And it largely has to do with the spectrum that it occupies, the kind of power levels that you transmit and so forth, right? Uh, um, and and uh, uh, so, so in that sense, um, you know, 5G, similar to all other wireless technologies, 
can potentially create uh, health-related issues if if it's transmitting um, high power levels uh, in in, um, in in you know um, uh, water ionization bands they call it. So those spaces in the frequency spectrum where if radio energy hits you. Um, at that frequency, it sort of excites water molecules in your body. And, it, you know, there's been many studies and many court cases around the, the, the effect of having a base station sitting next to, to people's houses, whether it creates cancer and so forth. So all of those health considerations are still there with 5G as well, right? And it, 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 um, it obviously relates to what spectrums are being used for 5G. And I think I, I, I did show you a little bit of the the, uh, um, what I'll do is, is I'll add a slide for you guys. I don't have it at the moment. I'll, I'll show you which spectrums are, spectrum regions are actually used for the different technologies. In, in South Africa, our 5G will largely run on spectrum that's been allocated for older technologies, you know, technologies up to 3G in it, um, at least initially. And it has to do a lot with our regulator being slow at allocating the right spectrum for, for 5G and 4G technologies and mobile providers then having to do something called spectrum reharvesting, right? So, 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 um, so, so at a, at a, at a physical level, yes. So any, any radiating technology has the potential to create harm, right? With regards to these weird and wonderful conspiracy theories and, 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 and strange things that people believe, uh, um, you know, um, with, without getting into politics, so I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, the, 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 the irresponsible way in our, which our politicians promote, uh, um, you know, conspiracy theories and these completely out there ideas. Um, is that together with the fact that obviously, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, whenever a new technology enters, enters the, the, the public domain, there's always some hesitance in terms of adoption. But what's happening around 5G is sort of odd. So I hope that sort of answers the first question. Right. With regards to the second question around what role should 5G play, right? So, so uh, in, 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 the, in the pandemic era that we're facing now, right? So, so the, the, the telecommunications industry in South Africa created something called the COVID-19 ICT task force, right? And this is all the public sector players, all the private sector players came together during the last year to sort of explore where we have gaps in our South African telecommunications infrastructure uh, uh, in terms of allowing people to continue to work, right? And, and you know, allowing people to get onto Zoom and, and Teams calls and those kinds of things. And, and they made a wide variety of recommendations, but the one key recommendation that they made is, is we need to expedite 5G because 5G has the ability to give you near fiber kind of capacities in terms of speed at a relatively, maybe not so much a low cost of rollout, but a quick rollout right to, to build a mobile network is quicker than building a fiber network so so things like 5g and 4g are, are we believe are key to ensure that people can continue with their lives in some sensible way in in specifically the education and and science domains that we we operate in um, for us we have by and large connected the bulk of university and research organizations and even you know, TVETs, you know, vocational training colleges using fiber, but it's getting to schools that's really, really difficult. Many schools, we have 25 odd thousand schools in South Africa. Many of them sit under trees and all kinds of rural places where there's no fiber. So for us, 5G is, is, is 5G and 4G is a viable technology to get to some of these really uh, uh, hard to get to places, as is some of these new satellite technologies that's coming, you know, the, the things that that Starlink and OneWeb and Amazon is, is trying to do. So in, 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 in a nutshell, the, 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 the role of 5G, in my view, is, is really to ensure the world continues, right? It's, it's, um, it's, it's key for our success to continue, which is why I think we, uh, if you've been tracking the news, you know, we had for many, many years, a stagnant ICASA not handing out spectrum for 4G and never mind even talking about spectrum for 5G to the mobile providers. Suddenly, there's now movement. You know, um, you know, spectrum auctions are opening up and those kinds of things are starting to happen. And I believe a lot of it has to do with the pressure generated by the pandemic and, and, and the need for our economy to continue through the use of communication. So let me leave it at that, Derek. I hope that answers the two questions. Great. Thank you, Leon. 
Um, that was really, very interesting with direct practical value to most of us. I know you have another meeting that you need to run off to. Do you have time for one or two more questions, maybe? Um, I can continue. I'm, I'm only due at 11, but I do know I've got an hour yet, and I'm probably going to exceed okay. that already. We are um, um, slightly, but um, just quickly, um, there's a question which probably leads on to the previous questions around 5G. Uh, asking yes. what's the source of our 5G network and does it come from China and is it secure? So, so <laughs> that's a good question, right? So we do not currently enforce the same restrictions as the UK and the US on, on Chinese vendors. Um, uh, that might change. Uh, I, I, I'm not uh, uh, versed at, at what the, you know, the, the political decision makers are currently thinking and what they're planning. I do know that, for example, the UK might uh, might now, with the, the new Biden era kicking in, actually forego that decision to 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 um, to uh, to uh, limit the the Chinese manufacturers from from entering their market. Um, in terms of technology maturity, um, quite honestly, there is a, a lot of players in this space that's trying to build mature technologies and mature solutions. Some of them are getting close, but the only real mature ones currently that's ready for operation is, is, is the, the gear produced by Huawei, right? So, so we are sort of left uh, with this one big option if we want to roll out 5G now. Um, whether, whether they intercept our traffic or not, you know, I've, I've, uh, undoubtedly they do that, right? But I, I am fairly certain that the variety of other vendors in the market does the same thing. Um, so, so um, you know, the, 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 the question is, is, is what can they do with what they intercept, right? We, we have, if you again go to the OSI model, we now have the ability, and we have a variety of technologies that allows for encryption from application level onwards, right? So where, where their equipment starts playing a role is, is you know, from, from layers three and downwards, right? So they are are effectively having visibility on already encrypted data streams, right? So what can they really do with, with the data that's encrypted? They can obviously do a lot with the metadata and it sort of brings us to the conversation around WhatsApp, you know, and the things that's been changing around WhatsApp, although it's not really changing. It's just being made visible of what Facebook already had planned. Um, and it has to do with metadata. You know, what, what kind of, of, of knowledge can you gain by looking at who people calls? how frequently they call, how long they call, you know, those kinds of things, which sites they visit, um, how long do they visit. Um, uh, so so the, the, the actual content of our communication that will be carried over 5G, uh, I doubt the vendors, whether it's Huawei or anyone else, will have visibility on, but the metadata is a different story. So I hope that sort of answers the question. So for, for us in South Africa, Huawei gear is being used to roll out 5G as we speak. You know, Rain, I believe, is, is building the first 5G network now using Huawei technology. And then maybe just shortly, um, in, your, in your discussion earlier on, and especially that slide that was visible, the last one, you referred to back-end networks. Well, what does that mean? Yeah. So, so if you look at a mobile communication network, I, I'm, 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 uh, what I'll do is, is in my slides, I'll add a slide to that effect for you guys that it, that it shows you is, is that um, what you experience is only the, the, the cell phone speaking to the base station, right? Now, the base stations, they need to be connected to big switches that, that decide where traffic goes. And these things eventually need to, need to be connected to gateways that connect them to, to, to other networks, right? So, you have, you have this aggregation that happens from, from individual users being multiplexed onto fiber, and, onto fiber connections to eventually having these massive big pipes that could even go overseas. So and that is the back-end network, right? So the front-end side is the radio side. It's the side we all experience. The back-end is everything that happens from base station into deeper into the network. Does that make sense, Derek? Yes, yeah, so it sounds like even when we talk about the mobile, the radio side of things, that can't operate without the fiber. The fiber really seems to be... It can't. Look, some, some of the evolutions in 4G and 5G has to do with trying to, to, to also implement as part of the standards technologies that allow cell phones to, for example, directly connect to one another, you know, point-to-point -point connect to one another. 
but largely how our telecommunications work at the moment is, is that your cell phone connects to a base station, the base station connects to a mobile switching center, the switching center connects to another base station and that connects to the guy that you're talking to. So there's no direct connection between the phones at this stage. Uh, but the new standards are trying to evolve that, that you might have the initial call set up through that backend channel. But when it starts running, the two phones can directly talk to one another. So, um, and that is called peer-to-peer -peer connections. Uh, we do have technologies that do that. A good example is Wi-Fi, right? With Wi-Fi, you can have two notebooks connect directly to one another without having to connect via some kind of base station function. But on the, on the mobile side, that's not the case. And it largely has to do with the fact that something needs to manage mobility. You know, when you move around, the call needs to shift as you move, right? And that needs the network's intervention. Good. So, Thank okay, you. let me continue. I still have a fair amount of slides. I'm not sure what your time looks like, Derek. Can, uh, can you much, guys- How much uh, people have to go through, uh, Dion? Um, I probably have a good 10 more slides. Okay. Um, yes, let's 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 get going. But uh, if we can race through that, then that would be great. Thank you. Let me do that. Right. So on satellite communications, um, very briefly, is is that uh, you know the way in which satellite systems have been uh, sort of classified, you know, since their inception in the in the in the late sixties and so on, all the way up to now, is in sort of two ways. There's there's the frequency band that a, a satellite system use, and we have a wide variety of bands. You know, I've listed some of them there at the top the L, S, C, X, K, U, K, K, A bands, and then the newer band, the V band, that'll be used by the likes of, of SpaceX. And these are just different frequency ranges in the um, satellite spectrum that's used for different types of satellite communications. The second way in which satellite systems are classified are actually based around where the satellites are, are located and, you know, and how they move with the Earth. Um, we had for a long time by and large geostationary uh, uh, satellites that were located fairly high up. You know, I think, you know, we're talking about 20, 20 kilometers plus um, uh, above the, the earth. And they were located at a fixed position um, on the earth. So they, 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 they rotate with the earth. And this is the kind of technology that we typically use for, for backbone connectivity, for the likes of, of, of satellite television distribution and so forth. Through to, to the more interesting things that, that, uh, that, that's been there for a while, um, but they're really the basis on which things like SpaceX will build their technology, and that is low Earth orbit satellites, right? So these are satellites that's at much lower heights from, from the Earth, um, and, and, and they are moving around, right? They're moving in, 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 in orbital patterns around the Earth, and there are many, thousands and thousands of them contemplated by the likes of SpaceX, Amazon, and OneWeb, right? Now, low Earth orbit technologies existed for a long time. It's just been expensive, right? The, from getting a satellite built to getting it into space to actually having a terminal that you could use to receive connectivity on, you know, um, or a satellite phone, everything was expensive. So, so the big drive to, to, um, to make something like Starlink, you know, SpaceX's effort and Kuiper, you know, Amazon's effort, a success really has to do about uh, has to do with how technology has evolved and how delivery platforms have evolved to make things cheaper right so if we look at next generation satellite systems that are really going to be geared towards providing end internet end user internet access we have sort of three big players there right we um, we have spacex with their starlink system amazon with their caper system and OneWeb. OneWeb is a is going through some financial difficulties, but we believe they will survive. Now, all of them have the sort of the same idea of, you know, basically sticking in the sky thousands and thousands and thousands of small lightweight satellites at low cost. Um, and then also providing the end users with low, low cost, lightweight, uh, you know, terminal devices. So, so in the case of Starlink, you know, the, the, the SpaceX effort, the Tesla effort, they're contemplating eventually having, you know, in excess of 30,000 satellites um, in space, you know, these satellites are fairly small, we, you know, we're talking 200, 250 odd kilograms. Then in terms of the end user devices, because in the old days before this was possible, you know, the receiving satellite uh, connectivity, you needed massive big satellite receiver stations with these big dishes. And that's changing. We now you know, have devices as small as a pizza box that have built into it phased array antennas. It's low cost, low power. 
And um, the amazing thing is, is these things can do massive amounts of bandwidth, or that is what SpaceX and Amazon's claiming. So the, the, if you were to look at what, what the offering of SpaceX is, and it's not yet in the market, is they're saying that for $99 a month, uh, you know, plus an initial sort of equipment fee of about 500 bucks to get your, your terminal, you're going to be able to get between 50 megabits per second and 150 megabits per second. Again, I think uh, um, you need to take that with a pinch of salt because it's probably contested. It's probably a function of weather and all kinds of other things as well. But look, this becomes a viable alternative to, to fiber. All right. So another fiber technology that I wanted to quickly talk about is submarine cables, right? How do we interconnect continents, right? The, the, the planet needs to interconnect uh, across the oceans as well, right? Now, while satellite connectivity um, contributes to this, the, the kind of capacities that that we are moving between continents is, you know, is it, it's it's insanely big the amount of traffic that's moving be between the, the different continents, specifically between uh, uh, Europe, US, and the rest of the world. You know, because the the main cloud providers sit in Europe, in the US, and to some extent also in China. Um, so so this picture that I've got here, you can actually go and have a look at, at a much larger real time sort of global map of what the submarine cable environment looks like across the entire globe at submarinecablemap.com. Um, this sort of shows the satellite or the, 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 um, the, the um, submarine cable, uh, uh, you know, environment or ecosystem that's currently in place around Africa, because that's what, what sort of impacts us. So for us in South Africa, we have sort of two main places where our undersea cables come in. The one is in Tanzania and KwaZulu-Natal, the other one's Esterfortein and Western Cape. All of our fiber systems that connect us to, to the rest of the world come into those two, two spots. So we have a lot of landing stations at those two towns. So on the West Coast, the main cables that we have currently in place are, are effectively the West Africa cable system as well as the, 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 the SAT-3 system, right, which is an older system. So the West Africa cable system is, is a newer system. It, it, it lands in various places along the African coast, uh, and it eventually also goes all the way through to Europe. On the East Coast, we have, you know, uh, a number of systems in the form of CECOM, um, as, as well as the EASY system. Um, and then we have some, and, and, and you'll, you'll note, most of these cable systems get us all the way to Europe. So whenever we need to communicate with places such as the US, which is fairly frequent, um, we had to do that via Europe. You know, we'll connect to Europe and then from Europe, you'll transgress the, the Atlantic Ocean to get to, to the US. But, but that, that is space is also changing. You know, recent addition um, to, to the, the transatlantic space is the SACS cable, the South Atlantic uh, cable system that's implemented by the... Uh, uh, um, the Anglo Angola Telecoms uh, group. Um, and that runs from, from, uh, um, from, from Angola all the way to Fortaleza in Brazil. And this for us now also provides us with a route that's uh, 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 you know, a nice redundant route that gets us to the US. So the two pictures on the left-hand side, I simply wanted to show you guys some of the gear that typically makes up an uh, undersea cable system. It consists largely of actual cable um, and what's interesting about this cable is it's usually very extensively fortified, so it's made strong so that it can handle tectonic plate shifts and those kinds of things, you know, uh, thermal activity on the ocean floor and so on. Um, and then usually along the, the ocean bottom, there's, there's a, the ocean floor, there's a wide no, or a large number of, of repeaters and equalizers placed down onto the ocean floor. And this has to do with beefing up and boosting the signal as it as it moves along these very, very long distances. To give you guys an idea, the wax cable that runs here from Acerfontein, um, it bumps off in a number of places, but there's some options to run what, what's called an express route without dropping off in some of the Western African countries. Uh, to get to Europe is about 11,000 kilometers. Right, so you need to beef up the signal along the way. And then obviously where cables, uh, where the cable branches into countries and go and lands, there's branching units. Um, what, what obviously is a big difficulty for telecommunication uh, providers globally is when we have failures of these cables. And it, it happens to some extent due to natural events like tectonic shifts and so on, especially here on the, the Eastern side, here on the, the, the Indian Ocean side, we have a lot of, of tectonic activity more so than on the, the Atlantic Ocean side of things. Um, similarly in the Pacific Ocean, that's not shown on this picture. 
But um, what, 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 what tends to end up breaking the cables the most are, are uh, you know, fishing trawlers that uh, throw out nets and they pull the cable up and it tangles into their nets and they simply cut it off with chainsaws. And then it costs a lot of money and a lot of time and, and very skilled people to go and fix those cables because the fix um, is not an easy thing. You know, some of it requires the cable to be lifted back onto a ship and be repaired there where splicing of the broken fiber happens. And then it needs to be placed down on the ocean bottom and so forth. And that is why when we have outages, um, it takes, it, it can take to, up to some weeks, right? I, I believe in when was the last time we had some outages? I think it was late in 2019. We had sort of a dual outage. We had Seacom and Wax going down sort of at the same time, which was terrible. Um, fortunately, there was still the easy and sat three cables to carry South African traffic, but you should have experienced some degradation in your internet connectivity experience. Right, so um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this slide, but I wanted to just highlight it as well is that there's obviously a wide variety of communication technologies that focus specifically on short range device to device communication, right? The one that we all use is Wi-Fi, right? It's, it's standardized by the IEEE. It's the most prolific LAN technology that people use, more so even now than cabling. Um, and uh, the IEEE standard for this, there's actually a variety of them. They've evolved over time, all fits under a group of standards called 802.16. The current latest standard is something called 802.16 AC. Many of you guys might not even have this in your homes yet. Many of us are stuck at N. Um, and uh, at Wi-Fi operates in two sort of open uh, or free um, uh, uh, spectrum ranges, the 2.4 gig and 5 gig bands, where you don't need licenses if you if you remain under under 10 milliwatts of transmission power, um, and and with the latest standard, with the the AC standard, you know 802.16 AC, you know we're talking about a, a gigabit per second and more that you can do over a 5 gig connection, 5 gigahertz frequency connection, and and you know up to about 450 megabits per second on the 2.4 gig frequency band. What is interesting though, as much as Wi-Fi was developed as a LAN technology in a short range thing, it has evolved, right? There's something now called wireless mesh technology, which really uses Wi-Fi and it gives it steroids, it, it beefs up its, its power, it adds multiple radio channels to give a diversity with multiple antennas. And it allows you to actually now start using Wi-Fi as a viable technology for longer range connections. So it's becoming a technology that actually is also used to build metro networks. Then we have Bluetooth, right? All of us use Bluetooth to connect all kinds of devices to our cell phones and speakers and so forth and connect to your car and what have you. The standard for this is IEEE 802.15.1. And there's a variety of versions of this currently active in the market, in the, in the, uh, you know, in the user space. Um, most of us have cell phones that are sitting at either a 4.2 or a 4.1 kind of level uh, or version of Bluetooth. But there is already a new version of, of Bluetooth available, available now, version 5. And version 5 will allow you to actually get to, to you know, significantly longer uh, reaches. You know, we're talking 240 odd meters, which is four times as much as you can get with the, the version 4. Then we have, uh, in most of our cell phones these days, we all have something called NFC or near field communications, which is which embodies a set of standards that includes things like RFIDs. You know, um, it, it, it's, it's a technology built to do contact list exchanges, you know, short bursts of exchanges of data over short ranges. And we're talking typically less than four centimeters. Um, again, there's a series of standards that, that define these things. And, and, and there's a variety of applications for this with probably the most prolific application for this being our contact list, uh, you know, credit cards that use this. And then lastly, um, you know, a whole group of new device to device technologies, communication technologies have evolved out of the, the drive to, to, to create what we call Internet of Things, um, IoT. And I'll talk about Internet of Things in a little bit more detail now. So Internet of Things uh, is, is a concept that uh, um, basically involves allowing all kinds of stuff, you know, physical objects, to be able to get connectivity onto the internet for a variety of reasons, you know. Um, in the early days, the Internet of Things concepts had some silly ideas, you know, some silly use cases, things like your fridge would connect to the internet and it would order food for, for, for you without you intervening, those kinds of silly applications. But there are much more viable, useful applications that, 
that Internet of Things are, are, are being used for now. You know, for example, te telemetry, um, you know, sensor data that's being collected um, on motor vehicles um, in mines and so forth that allows through data analytics and artificial intelligence much more advanced than real-time decision-making to be done to action things. So there's the, 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 the use of Internet of Things uh, is evolving into more useful use cases, right? And then, and we are seeing this everywhere, right? We're seeing sensors now being embedded on all kinds of things. You know, um, health trackers is just one interesting uh, domain where, where uh, you know, Internet of Things has really taken a foothold. Um, a key driver in, in, in making Internet of Things work was really the advent of, of the latest version of Internet Protocol technology which is called IP version six. It's the way in which we standardize our, 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 our addressing of internet enabled devices uh, evolved such that we can now have literally thousands and thousands of devices with unique addresses per square meter on the entire earth. So this new standard of IP version six, it's not really new anymore. It's just getting really implemented at full force now, has allowed us to, to provide unique addresses to, to, to these small devices. Maybe one quick use case that, that I've, I've seen personally that, that, that is for me one of the most interesting uses of Internet of Things is in, in Porto, in Portugal, the uh, Universo, University of Porto has a project that they're doing with the town council where they have provided bus drivers with, uh, with uh, health sensors that, that measure heart rate and those kinds of classic things that you measure with health trackers. Um, these health trackers then real time connect that data through 4G connections in their, on their buses to, to, um, to the 4G network that spans the entire city. And they, in real time, collect, you know, heart rate data and, and you know, health data and health statistics of the bus drivers um, at, at central locations at the university where they do with, you know, big supercomputers, all kinds of fancy data analytics. And from that, they have models that they use to then guide the town council on how to, in real time, adapt the, the way in which traffic is managed throughout the city. So for example, if they find that bus drivers tend to experience elevated heart rates on a specific road that is currently a dual carriage road, they might actually change that road real time through, through uh, uh, um, you know, again, Internet of Things kind of connectivity to, to traffic robots and so forth to become a single carriage lane to drop the stress levels of bus drivers. And they can do this on the fly. So, so those kinds of applications will become more and more and more. Um, what is interesting though is, is that as much as Internet of Things is largely built on existing technologies, you know, from the Bluetooths and Wi-Fi's and RFID technologies that we all use and, and, and LTE and 5G in the future, that has been a, a, a significant drive to develop some dedicated connection technologies and security and, 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 and encryption technology specifically for Internet of Things. Um, with two of the most, most prolific ones being Zigbee and Z-Wave. Right. With that, um, um, the last slide that I have before I want to quickly talk about, you know, just pricing in South Africa is, is just to highlight, you know, some of the cool things that's coming and in terms of telecommunication technologies. You know, obviously 5G is a really cool thing, right? And it's going to be with us for a long time and it in itself will evolve probably for, uh, you know, Derek, as you've indicated, probably for a decade or more. Um, and it is it is really a next generation technology. Um, and I think the whole world is looking forward to this. But there are other interesting things as well. For example, in the, in the space of building the back end networks, the big core networks, the backbones and the metros and so forth, we have sort of two big things that's happening currently. The one is called software defined networking and the other is network functions virtualization. So software defined networking has to do with how traffic is routed through our net, big backbone networks, you know, between the cities, between the continents and so on. The intelligence behind that. Um, when, when these, you know, these protocols that I elaborated earlier on when I spoke about the OSI model was developed, the routing protocols, and they're still being developed. Um, at that stage, bandwidth was fairly limited, right? You know, uh, you know, copper cables was the standard and you couldn't push a lot of data through those things. So you didn't want to use a lot of, of, uh, um, uh, of your bandwidth for routers and switching devices to actually speak with one another to negotiate routes, right? Um, which is called, it's called in-band signaling. So that kind of, of, of bandwidth use wasn't, wasn't 
you know, it, it wasn't seen favorably because bandwidth was limited, right? Which resulted in an interesting thing. It resulted in network technologies being developed to really place a lot of the intelligence in a decentralized way into our routers and switches. So these actual nodes that make up our networks, routers and switches and all these devices are fairly intelligent devices as we speak. They're capable of sort of guessing the best route that traffic needs to go without really knowing the entire network, um, you know, and, and in understanding how the entire network is loaded. Um, and and it, 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 as, I, as I said, it was created in this way so that there wasn't a need for a lot of communication between routers and switches. However, now we're moving to fiber and suddenly there is bandwidth in abundance. This allows us actually to, to, to use a fair amount of bandwidth for the transmission of network management data to manage how connections are made. And this is resulting in an interesting shift where the intelligence of how routes are created through networks are now becoming more and more centralized and our routers and switches are becoming dumber devices that simply forward traffic on instruction from this central intelligence. So as much as it does maybe create, you know, more uh, a room for, for single points of failure in a network by having a single intelligence that decides how routes are established, it is creating a situation where the routing of our traffic through our networks is happening much quicker and much more efficient. The second, the second uh, thing that's happening in, in the networking space is network functions virtualization. So, so if you look at routers and switches and, and all kinds of other network devices, firewalls, proxies, many of these devices are very specific to their function. You would buy, for example, a 40 net firewall box, right? It's got its network connectors on it and it's got all kinds of fancy and expensive hardware in it. And it has one function. Its function is to be a firewall. Or you would buy a Cisco router and its single focus in the, on the planet is to act as a Cisco router that routes IP, TCP IP traffic. So, so this is great for the vendors, right? Because they can charge you immense amounts of money for these boxes. But it's bad for us that build networks and want to bring costs down. So with network functions virtualization, there is a shift to something called white boxes. And the idea is, is to create generic hardware platforms that you can purpose to become all kinds of different things in a network. You can take one box with a bunch of network ports, with a bunch of computing a capability internally and you can make it a firewall or you can make it a router you can make it a switch if you add an antenna you can even make it a 5g base station right so the goal of network functions virtualization is really a drive to bring costs down then uh, very briefly some some other interesting things that's happening is, is there's there's a there's a there's a drive now to create something called li-fi right so this is to use a visible light as a communication channel as a physical layer a layer one to transmit data, right? And, and um, it's, it's really at its early stages, but what you might eventually see is, is that when you're sitting in an airport, you won't connect to the airport's Wi-Fi, you'll connect to its Li-Fi. And the LED lamps that's sitting all across its roof is actually, without you being aware of it, transmitting in the visible light, embedded in the visible light, is transmitting network signals and network traffic, right? And your laptop or your cell phone with its own little LED might communicate back. So this is something really cool that's happening. Um, we'll have to see where it goes. TV white spaces. TV white spaces is, um, is, is a technology that's been in evolution for, for, for a good decade now. And it's not quite taken foothold yet, largely because of challenges around standardization as well as licensing. But what it has at, at, at its core is a cognitive radio, a smart radio that can sense open spectrum, specifically spectrum, and the good old UHF, VHF spectrum bands, you know, 470 megahertz to 790 megahertz, where television signals, old analog television signals used to get stuck in. And what these radios do is they can sense that there's open spectrum and they stick in data until the spectrum's full. So it adapts almost like DSL did for copper. This is doing for, for spectrum in the TV space. In South Africa, we have had some trials of this. There's high hopes that this might become a, uh, a way to create cheap and quick solutions to connect schools. Um, as much as there will be things like 5G, 5G is, is a much more expensive technology than TV white spaces. The biggest reason why we're struggling in South Africa to make it a sort of a, 
uh, a standard technology that you see everywhere connecting schools and, and, and other low, you know, uh, low income communities is, is it's, it's largely has to do with licensing. In South Africa, as you guys know, we are, you know, we are a, a number of years behind in our digital migration plan. Digital migration has to do with the country moving from analog television to digital television. While we still have analog television stuck in that frequency band, TV white spaces is not a viable technology yet. The last interesting technology I wanted to mention is a, uh, is, is, is a drive to, to effectively, if we, if we look at the OSI layer in terms of data presentation, is to move away from ones and zeros and, and to move to, to, to quantum ways in which to represent information um, called qubits. And then in, in the physical layer and the data link layer is to use all kinds of interesting theorems and concepts that exist in the quantum computing space, you know, things like entanglement and superposition to build the next generation of telecommunication systems that'll have infinite bandwidth, infinite security, um, but it will be infinitely expensive, right? So quantum communications is something that is coming. In South Africa now, our Department of Science and Innovation is contemplating building a test bed to try and, try and build one of the first quantum networks on the planet. Right, so lastly, a, a, a slide that's a little bit difficult to, to maybe see the detail here. What, what, what I wanted to show is, is this is a study that was done by Picodi in 2019, where they, they interviewed or they, they investigated the price points for broadband connectivity, uncapped broadband connections, uh, uh, you know, amongst, I think they looked at a sample size of 66 countries. And um, what, they, what they sort of produce is two main results that I wanted to show here. The one result here on the right-hand side is um, the cost in dollars per month for a, a, an uncapped uh, 100 megabit per second fiber to the home link. And what you will notice out of all the countries that they, they've investigated, South Africa was sitting at the most expensive price point. You know, what is that? Um, uh, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit there. Um, you know, $87 per month for a 100 meg uncapped link. And, and if you look at it, we are completely more expensive, way more expensive than anyone else, you know, including a lot of, you know, developing countries. You know, I might look at Brazil as still a developing country and some others as well, you know, India. Um, so, so we all know this, right? So telecommunications in South Africa remains extremely expensive. On the left-hand side, this, this was uh, 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 part of that study, uh, an effort to try and see what can you buy for $20 a month in terms of an, an uncapped connection. And you will note that South Africa does not even feature on that list because we at that stage had no products in our market at that cheap price. But if you look at some of the other countries, you know, look at Hungary, you can buy a one gigabit per second link uncapped to your house for $20 a month. You know, what's that? 300 rand, right? We, you know, we have nothing, right? You, 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 what can you buy for a 300 rand uh, a price tag in South Africa now? Maybe a 10 megabit per second link, which is, you know, a hundredth of the capacity that they're getting in, in, in Hungary. And, and this is frustrating, especially if you look at places like India, that from a development perspective, and if you look at BRICS in general, sits arguably at the same developmental level as us. So, so there is something definitely broken in our, our communications uh, uh, market. Um, and, and the guys, it's part of it's making heaps and heaps of money. With this, Derek, I, I'm, I'm going to pause here again for questions and that those that, that need to leave can do so. I have a little bit of time, and, and what I'd like to do is tell you guys a little bit about our network, the, the South African NREM. But maybe first an opportunity for some questions. Great, thanks, Leon. Um, it's evident that you're a real propeller head, specifically relating to communication technology. And um, once again, thank you for this presentation. Um, we will well, just for the quickly just see what <laughs> other questions we have. I don't see anything on the chat side. Um, Anybody waving their hand to ask a verbal question? Um, so, so the next few slides, uh, I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about national research and education networks and, and where these things come from and why they're important. And they, they are definitely important for you as well because you guys undoubtedly have, you know, either kids at school or at a university 
or grandkids, who knows? Um, and, and, and given that, that um, you know, South Africa is trying to evolve from being a resource driven economy to a knowledge economy, you know, the ensuring that our, our, our education ecosystem and our research ecosystem is not hampered by low bandwidth makes uh, connectivity a key requirement, right? So um, globally, what happened is, is if you look back history-wise, you're sort of in the late 60s, there was the first efforts to actually create computer networks. And the first one that really saw the light of day was something called ARPANET, which was commissioned by the Department of Defense in the US and it connected uh, the Department of Defense and some defense laboratories as well as some universities that were doing research in energy sciences um, to this bespoke network that was developed at that stage. It had a very low number of nodes. I think it was something like 20 or 30 nodes. Um, it had no specific technology yet. And it, it was the test bed on which a lot of the technologies we're using now was founded. For example, TCP IP got built on that network and it evolved and it eventually got hijacked by the commercial world and it became our internet, right? However, this idea of having dedicated connectivity for research and education remained, right? And it resulted in many countries building uh, uh, what is called research and education networks. And these are effectively specialized network infrastructures and service providers that exclusively support the research and education innovation needs of a country, right? While, I must mention, while initially these networks were typically the, the test beds for new network technologies, and to some extent, some of them still are across the planet, most NRENs now these days tend to use off-the-shelf technology, although it is typically the, the latest flavors of those technologies. So currently we have more than 130 of these networks active globally. There's many of them. Um, and, and, you know, in most countries where, you know, the politicians had some sanity and, and things played out well, there's typically one of these networks that covers the entire education and science community. But in many countries, that's not the case. In South Africa, we have a complex environment, which I'll unpack a little bit, but we refer to ours as the, the, the South African NREN, SA NREN, um, of which SANREN is a part. Now, just to confuse you, SANREN and SA NREN is, is not quite the same thing. Um, then, you know, places like, for example, the Netherlands have a very mature network called SurfNet. Um, you know, uh, in, in, in the US, the good old ARPA network actually evolved into something that's now called the Energy Sciences Network and is being controlled by Berkeley University. In the UK, you've got Janet. In Brazil, or in, in, in Brazil, you've got something called R and P. Um, in New Zealand, you've got Rayons, Australia, Rnet. Many of these things, Sinet in, in, in uh, um, Japan, you know, Cernet in, in China, and so on. All right. So these networks function around sort of a model that's sort of standard for all of us, where the the capital expenditure to build the network is usually funded through some kind of government intervention out of the fiscus. While the operational side, you know, operating the network, running the call centers, fixing broken links, those kinds of things are handled by, from a funding perspective, by the beneficiaries, the guys that are eligible for connectivity onto the network. Most NRENs, and in our case, this is the case as well, are nonprofit organizations. So SANREN is a nonprofit business unit inside the, 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 the Council for Science and Industrial Research, but it's operated as nonprofit, even though the largest CSR is for profit. We have an operator that operates the network called TNET, and TNET is a private nonprofit company. And we have a baby brother called Sabin, South African Broadband Education Network, that's currently responsible for connecting the TVETs onto the network. They're also a nonprofit. And this is true for most NRNs across the planet. Now, when we build networks, as I said, as much as we use standard technologies where we can, we do have sort of a paradigm shift when, when we think about network connectivity technology. We, we, we try and provide what we call quality of service, give you the best possible quality of service through over-provisioning. So this has to do with giving you more bandwidth than you need typically, but enough that you need to make a bursty transmission. Let's say, for example, you're a scientist, you're an astronomer, and you want to download a big data set from a telescope. And that data set is a few terabytes, and it's going to keep the network highly busy. We actually try and capacitate the network to carry that kind of traffic um, by default, as opposed to pushing you into contention, right, where you contest bandwidth. So we don't like contention, right? That's, that's the main difference between us and the commercial network. 
commercial networks and we don't make massive amounts of money right so the services that we provide on endrens include the entire scope of normal internet services you know from you know being able to access web services through to video conferencing stuff and so forth as well as a bunch of services that's unique for example we provide things called uh, um uh, light paths, which is dedicated point to point connections on our networks to, for example, connect a supercomputer at one university to a, uh, uh, let's say, a, a magnetron at another university. We also provide things like science demilitarized zones, which are ways in which you can carry big amounts of data, science data, without pushing it through firewalls that create bottlenecks. And then probably the single biggest thing we've done in our communities, we've created something called EduRoam. EduRoam is a service that run on top of Wi-Fi. So when, when you are at one of the South African universities currently or science organizations, and you do a bit of a search for Wi-Fi networks, you'll see EduRoam is one available one there. And if you try and connect to it and you have a username and password that's been allocated to you by an institution that's part of the global EduRoam Federation, you know, all the universities and science organizations across the planet that have decided to trust one another's ability to hand out and test passwords and usernames. If you if you have a password and username from one of those institutions, you can connect to Eduroam at no cost anywhere on the planet, right? So if you're, let's say, a Turkey student and you are currently traveling in Brazil and, and you're in Sao Paulo, and, and you walk past, let's say, a, a student center that's broadcasting Eduroam, you can connect without having to type in all kinds of, of information in captive portals or things like that. It'll just connect using your normal EduRoam arrangement that you use for your home network, your home university, at no cost. You can get to all of your teaching and research resources at no cost. So EduRoam is, is, is one of the big things that we've done that has allowed students and researchers to use one another's networks at no cost anywhere on the planet. Right. In terms of the technologies we use, at the high end, our preference is always fiber optics. But at the low end, we some, sometimes need to connect places that there is no other way to do other than satellite. For example, we as the South African NREN connect the South African National Antarctic Project or SANAP. And needless to say, there's no fiber optics to the Antarctic, right? So we need to get to them using satellite. Um, so, so as time evolved, these individual research and education networks uh, evolved in different countries. There, there was a drive to eventually try and, and have these networks interconnect with one another in the most efficient way, as well as sort of create a platform through which these networks can buy technology from vendors more cheaply through buying power. And this resulted in the creation of a number of what we call re a regional research and education networks, or RNs, that span different regions of the planet. There's about six or seven of these. Um, and, and they take care, as, as the name says, said, of a specific region. And in, in, in Africa, we've got three. We've got something called Ubuntu Net Alliance that spans the South and Eastern Africa region. So it spans pretty much SADC plus Kenya and Uganda. That's not, not in, in SADC. And then we have something called WACREN, the West and Central Regional REN that spans Nigeria, Ivory Coast, all those places, Congo and so on. And at the top, we have the Arabic States Network. In Europe, there's a big, big network there that takes care of things like the you know, Large Hadron Collider, the, where they're doing the tests for the guard particles and those kinds of things. That network is called Giant. In the US, Mexico, uh, in Mexico, they have a network called Internet 2 that spans that region. Um, in Brazil and, and uh, Chile and Argentina and those places in South America, they have something called Red Clara and so on and so on. So there's, there's a number of these networks and, and they are a platform for us as individual national networks to work together as a, as a global community. Right, so the South African NREN fairly quickly, I'm gonna you know, very briefly explain a little bit of the history of the South African NREN. Um, in South Africa, network connectivity um, you know, uh, received a fair amount of attention by some of the universities in sort of the late eighties. And you, you, you currently still have Rhodes University claiming, and, and I, I think they're probably correct, claiming to be the first university to have sent an email across the Atlantic, right? Um, and um, what happened is, is that, you know, from an infrastructure perspective, for many, many years, uh, you know, uh, throughout the, the 80s, 90s, and, and, and 2000s, we were sort of stuck with one provider, and that was OpenServe or Telcom, it's, it's old name, OpenServe is it's sort of its new name for its wholesale side. Um, 
And um, that, that's what universities had to use and other research organizations had to use to connect to the rest of the world at very high cost. So some of them decided that they, as individual universities, were not keen on dealing with telecom directly, right? So they started uh, an effort with government to create something called UniNet or the University Network of South Africa in, in sort of the, the, the late 80s. Um, this was an effort that was hosted by an organization then called the Federation for Research and Development. It's now called the National Research Foundation. It sits there right next to the CSIR. And UniNet has had as a function basically th this role of being the South African NREM, right? Buying capacity or leasing capacity. That was one of the big dilemmas. You couldn't buy infrastructure from Telcom, you could only lease uh, services. Um, leasing this from telecom at very high cost on behalf of the research and education institutions. Now, as time progressed throughout the 90s, there were some, some, some governance related issues between the universities and, and obviously government that, that uh, uh, took care of UniNet, uh, resulting in eventually a break happening sort of in the late 90s where the universities decided that they're leaving UniNet. They were not happy with some of the the pricing models that were being contemplated by the, the NRF or then FRD. And um, what happened is, is, as a result of that, is that the UniNet sort of died out in the late 90s. The universities themselves, though, and the science councils realized that they still were stuck with this need to have someone or some entity take care of their interactions with telecom as a community. Um, so, so they went and they created an, a, a private sector alternative to UniNet called TNET, which is the Tertiary Education and Research Network of South Africa. Right? And TNET eventually took on pretty much the same role as, as UNED, leasing capacity from telecom. Towards the, the early 2000s, there was then a bit of a, a shift in our telecommunications market. We suddenly had a second network operator, fixed line operator entering the, the, the market as well, which eventually got the name Neotel. Right? And uh, a lot of the connectivity services that were being leased for the universities and science councils moved from telecom to Neotel, right? At the same time, sort of 2004, 2000, 2003, 2004 around, the Department for Science, uh, uh, Arts and Culture, I think it was called at that stage, DAXT, which is now Department of Science and Innovation. Um, it, it, um, it, it had sort of a, a, a number of big, science experiments on the horizon that was giving giving it somewhat of a concern in terms of connectivity the connectivity needs for these the one was that the, the entire planet was supporting the large hadron collider efforts you know particle uh, the, the particle physics experiments being done in switzerland um, and specifically um, uh, trying to help process the data that's being generated from that large hadron collider site um, so the dilemma is, is how do you get that data to South Africa? And, and after you've processed it with our supercomputing capabilities, how do you get it back in an efficient way? And you know, putting things on DVDs and flying it with an airplane is not efficient. Um, so, so that was one thing that was on the horizon. Something else that was really, really a big, big opportunity for South, uh, South Africa was the potential to, to act as host for the square kilometer array radio, uh, radio telescope. Uh, which at that stage in the early 2000s was go still going through its bid phase, right, where a number of countries was, were bidding for it. The eventual outcome was is that part of the telescope, functions of the, the telescope was, was awarded to South Africa and part of it was awarded to, to Australia. But we needed connectivity to be able, able to carry that kind of astronomy measurement data to the rest of the globe, and we didn't have that, right? So the, the Ministry of Science then commissioned a study, TNA did a study to go and look at what had to change in the government space uh, um, to, to effectively um, be able to do this kind of big science and also bring down the costs for universities. You know, universities were paying, just to give you guys an idea, you know, for a two megabit per second line, they were paying about 50,000 rands a month. It was insane. Um, so it was very expensive. So, so they commissioned TNET, TNET did a study of NRNs across the globe and they came back with some recommendations. The one recommendation was government needs to invest in buying infrastructure if that is at all possible in our telecommunications market, right? And secondly, the, the, um, the, the, the institutions themselves need to, need to only fund operations, you know, move to that standard NRN model. So at that stage, government took this to heart and they went and they found some money to actually go and acquire infrastructure for TNET. 
and to bring down the cost that they were, were paying. The dilemma was the South African telecommunications market did not offer the sale of infrastructure. Telcom didn't offer you to buy that infrastructure, neither did the, the new tel. But what happened then is this to, sort of 2004, there was this court case that uh, resulted in, you know, Mr. Minister Kasaburi had a fight with, I think it was, was it Autopage? Um, and they had this fight that resulted in our entire telecommunications market deregulating. And that deregulation brought a lot of new telecoms players into our market. And some of them actually offered the sale of infrastructure, the sale of fiber, which we call dark fiber. You know, when we buy fiber, we call it dark fiber. And there's a whole story behind why they have that strange name. Um, so, so the star short of the line. Um, so money was available, the market was changing. Um, and what happened then is, is the Department of Science and Technology or Science, Technology, Arts and Communications at that stage went to, uh, to the CSIR and said, can you guys create a dedicated team that ev effectively designs and acquires and implements a network for TNET? And that was the start of Sandrin, right? So Sandrin was born in 2006, 2007, and we've ever since worked together with TNET through uh, a collaboration agreement that governs who does what. That role split sometimes gets a little bit fuzzy, but it's largely still based around the idea that Sandrin designs and acquires the network. We also develop advanced services that you can't buy off the shelf. And we then hand this over to TNET to operate, right? So if you're a university and you're an IT director or someone in the IT department of university, you buy your internet services from TNET. TNET provides those services on top of Sandrin infrastructure, which we buy out of the commercial market. We had a third baby brother created in 2015 called Sabin, South African Broadband Education Network. This is a, a spin out out of TNET and it has the single focus of building fiber links from where we have infrastructure as Sandrin to connect to, to TVET sites. Now there's about 50 TVET colleges um, um, in South Africa and they have in, in excess of 300 sites uh, that needs connection. Some of them are on fiber networks, some of them are not at all. So needless to say, this is a major effort we're going through now. It's funded by the Department of Higher Education and Training, specifically geared towards getting all the students that's using TVETs also onto this network. Now, where it gets a bit messy, though, is, is, is around space, the, the schools and school space, right? So schools is politically a very hot, hot potato, and, and everyone wants to connect schools, right? The Vodacom's MTMs, everyone wants to, to be involved in connecting schools. Um, and it's resulted that together with the fact that the National Department of Education and, and the, the, the provincial governments are not quite working in sync with one another result, has resulted in a massively fractured connectivity uh, solution for schools to, to the extent that the bulk of schools are not connected. And when they're connected, they're connected at such terrible speeds that you cannot do online teaching and training. So the question is, is when do we connect schools right now we have connected some schools networks but um, until there is a major shift in where funding is being channeled by government towards the end um, we are stuck with this dilemma that schools are getting sort of you know the, the, the short end of the stick. Lastly that I just want to mention you know other than universities and science councils and big science experiments we connect a number of other interesting things as well we connect all the national libraries we connect some of the big academic hospitals, you know, Chris Harney, Banakwana, Grootskeer, all those places sit on sand and connectivity. Um, just to give you an idea of what the kind of capacities are that we provide, our network, if you add up the, 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 all the, the fiber pipes and the wireless pipes and satellite connections, all of those things, if you add them all up, we have a network capacity that exceeds about 4.5 terabits per second. Sandrin has connected, my team has connected in excess of 236 odd sites. And this is all the main campuses of all 26 universities. TNET has done many sites as well. And Sabin now, the, 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 the baby brother has been connecting a number of, of TVET colleges as well. Um, we we uh, recently, over the last five years, we've been working on this, but recently we've implemented a new backbone network, which interconnects all the major cities, you know, uh, um, Pretoria to Joburg, Joburg, Bloom, Bloom, PE, East London, uh, Cape Town um, uh, and so forth, uh, Durban as well, um, onto a, uh, a fiber network that we own the network for it for a term of 15 years. We have exclusive access to it and we are currently provisioning 100 gigabit per second circuits on it using DWDM, you know, using different colors of light. 
In terms of, of uh, uh, you know, links into some of the deeper rural areas where we struggle to get connectivity, um, we have sort of backbone extensions getting into places like, uh, you know, Whittlesea and Butterworth and all these smaller places where we've now at least got to those locations, links running at, at 10 gigabits per second. What we typically provide down to campuses and, and the actual institutions themselves usually exceed one gigabit per second. We, we provide no links lower than one gig per second. And we have some institutions, you know, for UCT as a good example, University of Cape Town as an example, where they have to their main campus a 40 gigabit per second link, right? In terms of connecting to the rest of the world, um, C, uh, TNET owns some capacity on CECOM. Uh, I think they own about 50 gigabits per second on CECOM. We own as Sandren a total of 7.3% of whatever capacity is currently available on the West Africa cable system, which currently for us equates to just under 900 gigabits per second. Y using this capacity, we, we, um, we also do swap arrangements to actually get access to some other undersea cables as well. We've done swaps with, uh, with uh, providers of EASY, of SAT3, of the South Atlantic cable system and so forth which means that our universities and science councils are currently connected to the rest of the world using five cable systems. So if one breaks or two breaks, it's not the end of the world. We actually find that many of the telcos, you know, Vodacoms and MTNs even come to us to ask for help when the big ones like Seacom and WAX go down. And then, you know, we have evolved as, as a South African National Research and Education Network, the SA Endring, to the point that we are now regarded as, as uh, one of the the, the, the 16 most advanced research and education networks on the planet, together with the likes of, of the networks from the US, from the UK, uh, Brazil, China, Japan, um, uh, France, Germany, and so forth, uh, uh, Australia, New Zealand. And as, as a, a sort of a community that we have as sort of the leaders in the space, we created a forum called the, the, the Global Endring CEOs Forum, from where we drive a variety of projects to actually get to this lofty goal of having a planet-wide free, open, uh, and an extremely fast planet-wide G ring or a global ring. So that's um, that's efforts that we are un currently undertaking. Um, this is a very high-level picture of our our backbone network that sort of shows you all of our big backbone pipes on our website, and I'll provide some links in the slides. Um, you can actually zoom into our various metros and you can go and see how individual campuses and so on are connected. Um, and here you can actually see we have many, many connections throughout the country uh, running now at 100 gigs, but also still some older ones running at 10, right, especially into these deeper rural areas. And there you can see out of Eisterfontein our connections on, on WAX and on SAT3. Um, and here on uh, the, the connections coming into Tanzania, that landing station, our connections on EASY and CECOM. Um, lastly, uh, but not least, is you know, uh, we do more than just connectivity. As much as our focus is connectivity and bringing down the cost of connectivity for our institutions, and maybe at this point I can mention, you know, I, I showed that slide of how much connectivity costs in South Africa for Joe Average on the street, and it is horribly expensive. But for our universities, it's not. Um, to give you guys an idea, a megabit per second per month costs, costs you six rand with us, which means that a 100, gig, uh, 100 meg pipe will cost you 600 rand. And then the, the pricing actually tapers off. You know, for, for uh, about 2,000 2, rands a month, the university can get a 10 gigabit per second pipe. So they can get massive capacities from us. That's equivalent to the kind of pricing you see in the rest of the planet. So this last little slide here actually shows just a variety of services that we are developing and providing on top of the network over and above normal internet services. And I already mentioned Eduron, Eduron being the single most important service that NRNs are developing. This Wi-Fi roaming technology that allows a student to connect to Eduron Wi-Fi anywhere on the planet at no cost. But we have a bunch of others as well, and many of them are actually geared towards the science community and allowing them to transport huge amounts of science data between collaborators. Um, and with that, uh, we have a bunch of new services being developed as well. Uh, the bulk of our focus is really around cybersecurity related services. So we have something called our uh, uh, cybersecurity incidents response team. 
uh, within Sandrine that are developing very advanced ways in which to, uh, to, to pick up intrusions on our network, you know, mal use of the network and so forth, which is obviously major concerns for everyone. But I think maybe I should should draw the line at that. This uh, this is really my last slide with a bunch of links that if you're interested in learning more about NNNs that you can go and have a look at. It shows our network, the traffic on our networks and so forth, um, as well as the efforts that we're going through as a larger community. And um, Derek, with that, I am now officially at the end of my presentation. My apologies for taking so long. <laughs>